Hello and welcome to Strictly Game Boy, the home of the DMG1. I am your host, Brian, and I am joined by my co-host, Clay. Greetings, Earthlings. I didn't say last names. I don't know why. Uh, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. It wasn't in the script this time. So. Right, sometimes I say my last name, but then I won't say my co-host's last name. Right, right, you know, out of just respect and right. fear. It's like, I don't know you. Right, I don't yeah. even know how to spell your last name. Yeah, this this is all in a script, so there's no, like... There's no deviation. You know, spontaneity, originality, it's like anything all, like that. Even right now, as I'm saying this, I'm literally reading from a cue card. Like, that's why it's not funny. We have a full cast and crew here. We yeah. have we have two guys full time on staff here. Ted, the producer over there. Ted, Ted, say hi. Uh, hi, Ted. And then we got two guys on that just hold up cue cards. They get pay- paid full time salary and a drummer. Ba-dum-ts. Okay. Anyway, uh, yeah, guys. I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, just a quick little production note before we get into this week's episode. Um, it's an important June, one, though. Yeah, it is. It's something that we need to sit down and have a real talk with you about. Look, guys, I'm going to flip my chair around backwards. And I'm going to sit cool. Let's rap. Like the younger. Listen, young fellows. Fellow young... Do they, do they, do they still do that? Is totally. it like sideways chair now? Is that the cool thing? Totally. All right. Um, no, but for real, uh, June is uh, officially upon us as of recording this. And, uh, yeah, things are going to get a little crazy for me and Brian here in the next month I mean, or so. You know, not to mention there's some E3 going on. Well, that that doesn't really affect the show. Not really. It is exciting. It's exciting. Nonetheless. But 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 that's not what we're talking about. No. <laughs> um, at the end of the month, uh, Brian is getting married, which is, which is super exciting. And so he's going to be super duper busy. <laughs> <laughs> I already uh, am. Yeah, he, well, he's already been busy for like the last six months. But I'm handcuffed to Clay's radiator right now just to even get this episode going. Yeah, I had to lock you in. I'm like, you can't leave. Um, and so that's happening. And so uh, there's going to be a lull there. And then directly following Brian getting back from his wedding, I'm moving away. And so, uh, which will be a, a bit of a change up for the show as part of it. We won't be recording face to face any longer. Which is bittersweet, um, but we're still going to be doing the show. I just think it's bitter. It's very bitter, it's not so bitter. sweet. But the show will continue, uh, but I am moving to a different state, and so there may or may not be some uh, time where there could be some transition there where I'm I'm not around. So, I'm saying all this just to get at, uh, if there's a lull between episodes... I think we've already had one here um, before this one. Uh, just bear with us as we're both going through some life transition. We're going to do our best to have some stuff to fill uh, if we're not able to do episodes together. In fact, I've already got something already done and ready for when the time comes that we're both super busy and can't <laughs> find the time to do this. So uh, stay tuned for that. Yeah, and- we, t- we talked about doubling up some episodes, but then that means we have to produce double the amount of episodes and and in the time where we're already kind of busy yeah, we, we tried to make a bank of some and it just it's not working right now yeah, so yeah unfortunately we love you i and thought about taking all of our recording stuff to our job that we work at together <laughs> and trying to record at work but we can we can construct a quiet room out of cardboard yes because we work in a loud <laughs> big warehouse so a big empty awful acoustic yes. warehouse that trucks and bosses can walk into it at a moment's notice and make all kinds of noise. You think playing a game of Rocket League is is harrowing and bad. Yeah, you know? right. So that probably won't work, unfortunately. But anyway, <laughs> we're probably dragging this on for too long. But it's important. We just want to let everybody know what's going on in our lives. And we uh, haven't forgot about you. Yes, we will. Once uh, once we hit about like a couple weeks into June, I think we'll be back in full stride. July. Right? Did I say June? Yes. Sorry, July. We'll be in full stride again. Um, Brian will have calmed down a little bit, and <laughs> and then uh, I should be all settled, and we can uh, get back into it. We'll see. We'll see how it works. Um, we'll have to start recording over Skype, so we'll have to find times that we can mm. both do it. But Yeah, and I can uh, start recording in the nude. You know, That's true. You no won't one... even have to put clothes on anymore. Right, yeah. It'll be nice. That's how so. I prefer it. I actually m- made you go home the first time we recorded because you didn't bring enough clothes. Hey, buddy. Yeah, I was like, no, come back with more clothes. What? I, I, I put a banana hammock on. 
That's not good enough. Speaking of banana hammocks, Brian, w- what are we doing this episode? Uh, <laughs> well, we have a great Super Game Boy episode for you today. Uh, every four episodes, we bring you a chronologic look into the top rated Game Boy games of all time. That's pretty well put. I guess. Yeah. Um, that works. That's pretty good for pulling it out of my butt. Yeah. Um, not scripted. Yeah, totally not scripted, even though uh, it's because they didn't move the cue card in time. Yeah, he was going too slow. So this week, uh, we are taking a look at Tetris. So, Clay, I am super excited about today's episode. Uh, I don't know. I'm oh, yeah? Hu- I'm, I'm a huge Tetris fan. Um, so why don't we get into it? Uh, okay. Let's let's go go ahead and uh, why don't you run through some of the deets? Yes, I'd love to share some of the deets with people. So, for those of you who have not heard of Tetris, get out. What's wrong with you? Get out of my episode. Your parents failed. <laughs> yeah. And uh, just, I mean, the amount of culture you let into your life has failed you, I guess, as well. You have is... not, if you have not had a Tetris dream in your life, I swear. I, I'm not sure I know what that is. It's when you play too much Tetris and then you see shapes falling while you're sleeping. Oh, I used to play so much DDR that if I closed my eyes, <sighs> I could see the arrows coming down. Yeah. So it's probably similar to that. Um, yes. So Tetris was developed by Bulletproof Software. As well as Nintendo. This version. Correct. Specifically. Yes, that's the version we're covering today. Yeah. Nintendo published it. Hank Rogers Bulletproof Software developed it. Right. And so, yeah. So we're, we're specifically talking about this, not just Tetris in general. Uh, this game was released along with the launch of the Game Boy, as we've mentioned here on the show before. So in Japan, June 14th, 1989... July 31st, 1989 in North America, and then in the PAL regions, September 28th, 1990. That seems a little late for a European release. Maybe they didn't get a launch? They were probably playing on their ZX Spectrums. Right. Jeez. You know. They probably had to port it over for PAL regions, you know, translate and I'm, all that. I'm sure Tetris actually hit Europe before it ever made it to Japan or North America. Right, they've probably been playing it up before yeah. this. That makes sense. Um, I'm we, not sure I know, but yeah. <laughs> it's a pretty, Yeah, it's a pretty easy guess to make. Uh, and then as far as whether or not this is a port or an original to the Game Boy, this is, in fact, a port. So um, I think a lot, of, a lot of people, at least in America, think of it as, you know, it's original. It's really... I mean, it was originally released. It's where it, like, exploded into the mainstream. But where was it in the United States? Where did it originally release? Uh, it probably would have come over through um, PC, like you know, so you know, shareware that kind of phenomenon in the nineties. Right. People were already kind of doing that peer to peer, so you would see like just any number of oh, let me just see what this game is that this person has. I'm I'm still not quite sure how it all works because I didn't grow up in that era. Um, but yeah, you could basically just get games from different people for free because of the nature of the internet at that point. Right. So people, a lot of people who were like in the know about PC gaming had played this game well before it was released on the NES or the Game Boy. Right. But I think at least Americans will view this version as being the original version for that. It's the definitive version for a lot of people. But I'm talking about in America, it's like the original version, though. Yeah. This was the first mass-produced, like, licensed, real version yes. released in the United States. Yeah, I'm this not is the saying first it, legal. Right, legal. <laughs> I'm not saying it's the original version uh, dif- like of all of them, but at least for Americans, this is what we know to be as like, when, our original. Yeah, when it Tetris. shook down, this is like the... If the NES came out before, then that was the first legal one, but... Yeah, it had been on Tengen uh, NES, so, so Atari had produced 100,000 cartridges at some point. Those ended up not being, those had to be recalled, but yeah. All right. Um, but if you go back even further, so this is really the story of Alexei Pajanov. Um, there are some other people involved as far as Russia's concerned. That's not really important. 
Uh, he basically made this game while he was working 14-hour days uh, programming for the Russian government. Uh, he was working on, like, AI technology. Like, the KGB was really interested in his, his like, AI tech. But just for, you know, for fun, he and his friends would kind of make games. And he made this one based off of an old, like, wooden block puzzle game as a kid. And tweaked it with the input of one of his friends. And till it became a game that he couldn't put down and, and you know, gave it to other people, they couldn't put it down. The old um, floppy disk? Yeah, thing. like, he, they wanted to to make and sell these because um, kind of the nature of Soviet Union in the mid 80s was they were trying to make business happen or capitalism, but they didn't know how to do it really. So he just ended up giving it out for free to everybody and wasn't making any money off of it. Um, he probably couldn't because he made it on company time. Right. Yeah. Uh, but this made its way around to a bunch of different places. It ended up in Hungary to where everyone was playing the game. And this guy called Robert Stein, who owned Andromeda Media, uh, he was basically a game hunter. Like, he was looking for something, like a license hunter. He wanted to bring things that weren't in the European region there. He wanted to discover stuff. That's kind of the same way that Hank Rogers happened upon it and, and wanted to bring games to Japan. So he sees someone, like, he goes to, like, look at different software in Hungary, and he sees someone playing this game in the corner, and he's like, what's that? I want to know about that. Like, that's the game I want to I wanna find out more about. He gets in contact with Alexi. Alexi has no idea how capitalism works, and he's like, yes, we would like to make a deal very much. And he got, like, a telex from him. That was his response. And so he thinks, cool, we're good. I've got a verbal commitment. We'll get the writing later. He had already set up, uh, he'd already licensed this out to two companies to make arcade and PC versions. And they ran with it. He de technically doesn't have the rights, but he's got a verbal commitment and he kind of thinks he does. But he's only just talking to the guy who made the game. So the two companies, Spectrum Holobyte and uh, Mirasoft, run off and start making their own versions of it. And then other people get a hold of it and want to license it to other regions, like they want to uh, make a home version of it, or they want to bring it to America, or they want to make an arcade version. They start licensing it out to other people, even though they don't really have the right to do that. It starts spreading uh, to other regions on every, like everything imaginable people were making this for. Uh, it shows up in America in Las Vegas at a trade show because I forget who who produced that version. It might have been Atari or it might have just been a PC version, but Hank Rogers sees it. Hank Rogers is a guy who grew up in Hawaii, uh, lived in Japan, um, was a Danish guy. Uh, he had a company called Bulletproof Software. He made probably one of the most influential RPGs of Japan. He kind of got RPG movement started in Japan. What was that called? Uh, Black Onyx, I think. Oh. Um, okay. But it, it that led into wizardry and basically JRPGs as we know them. Um, he sees this game, thinks it's really cool, talks to Atari, um, and he's like, hey, I want to put this in Japan. And they're like, well, we don't have any desire to go to Japan and do business, so here, here's the Japanese license cool, go make us some money. And he runs off, makes the game. Um, but he, what was it? He was talking about this would be a perfect game on the Game Boy. He had a really close relationship with Nintendo. He's like, look, let me let me get the, the Game Boy rights to this as well. And and uh, and then we'll just, you know, we'll make a ton of money that way. So he goes to Russia to lock down the portable rights the same time, Robert Stein is going to Russia because he's getting worried that his rights don't mean anything, and he wants those PC and arcade rights locked down. Also, some guy from Mirasoft is trying to hunt down the portable rights to the Game Boy as well. He shows up, works, like, he's trying to work out a deal with the Game Boy. He's very upfront with them. He explains to them, like, hey, I I'm not trying to screw you over. Here's my, here's my offer. And then he shows them his copy of the Japanese version. 
Like, hey, this is going to be playable, like, right now. I, I We made this. And Russia is horrified because they have no idea what this deal is. They never gave rights to it. They don't know where it could have come from. And he all of a sudden realizes there's something bigger at play here. And that he could get all of the rights. So he sits down with them, goes through their contract that they have written out with Stein. Points to where the discrepancy was. And it was... Russia had given them rights to different kinds of computers. They interpreted that as different styles of PC. Stein interpreted that as oh, anything that has a processor, you know, whatever. Right. So, uh, he lays kind of lays it out. He's really upfront with them. They kind of like his straightforward honesty. And then they take that and they go and play the other two sides. It's kind of like a really interesting story because they decided to play capitalism once again and this time they got it right they totally caught the other guys you know like by surprise I guess because they were like popped the game cart in front of him and said what is this in front of Mirasov and they're like oh it's probably a pirated copy and that told them that oh they don't actually have the rights they don't know what's going on and basically screwed them over screwed over Robert Stein they gave him his PC and arcade rights, but they weren't really worth anything at this point. And Hank Rogers calls in Minoru Arakawa, head of NOA, and Howard Lincoln, chairman of NOA. They fly out there, sign all the rights, and the rest is history. Nintendo releases one of the most popular games ever created because Hank Rogers was smart enough, cool enough, and also he and Alexi hit it off right away, and they own Tetris to this day. Um, that's kind of the roundabout explanation for it. Uh, there are books you can go read. Um, the Ultimate History of Video Games is one I bring up a lot. Uh, Game Over is kind of a romanticized telling of it. It's the history of Nintendo, but it, he kind of takes some liberties. But there have been more books written recently. Um, the story of Tetris used to be this kind of, did you know, sort of thing. And now it's like, oh yeah... Tetris is that that story everybody kind of is, like knows or has heard of because it's like, epic, dude. It, it's it's crazy. A uh, game over focuses like three huge chapters on it. Like wow. in the story of Nintendo, three of those chapters are about Tetris. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, it's really interesting. I kind of took some liberties as well. Like I was trying to rush through it, but um, yeah, go go look it up because it's really one of like the weirdest examples of just dealing with the Soviet Union and. And just how business works and how everything can just gets so messed up. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that long and very interesting tale with us, Brian. Um, real quick, let's go ahead and go through our history with this game. I'll start. Um, I, like I mentioned uh, earlier episodes, my sister got a Game Boy long before I did. And when she got her Game Boy, she got Super Mario Land and Tetris. Woo! And so the power couple there. And uh, I never was big into Tetris. I was the Mario kid. And so I just mostly played Mario. But I do remember playing Tetris uh, a little bit when she had it. Just kind of checking it out. But at that point, uh, honestly, for the majority of my life, I've never been a fan of puzzle games. Until very recently, probably the last three or four years, I've started enjoying them a lot more. So Tumblestone's pretty cool. Tumblestone was a big one that really pulled me in, and there's there's a couple others, um, but I still have a, a, a near and dear place in my heart for Tetris. I appreciate what it's done and what it is, uh, just never been very good at it or found myself enjoying it for long periods of time, so um, that's kind of my experience. I haven't really played a lot of the iterations that have followed, maybe dabbled with them here and there, but uh, not a big puzzle guy, unfortunately, so... Uh, so I'm making up for lost time now trying to find ones that I missed over the years and uh, yeah more to come on that so you need to go find a Tetris battle Gaiden I think yeah it's like a really unbalanced uh, like fighting Tetris game sort oh, of well I love unbalanced games yeah it, it's kind of it's kind of ridiculous and but it's really fun you have like power-ups and stuff that you can use against other people it's only in Japan though I wish they would bring it here everyone does huh Interesting. Um, I I think I played... I definitely played Tetris on NES before Game Boy. Um, but it was one of the few games my mom was really good at. And, and like, really good at. And it was... 
she was very competitive um, in the games that that she plays, and it was just me and her, so she had to have someone to play. So she taught me like her favorite card games, and then would just beat the crap out of me. And nice, uh, I would sit there and play Tetris with her, and she was so much better than I was. So it drove me to like get better at the game, even as a as a wee wee lad. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I I love Tetris. It is one of my favorite things in the entire world. I I don't think it's an understatement when you say it's one of the greatest games ever made. Um, Every cell phone I had up until the point when I started getting smartphones uh, had Tetris on it. It was my I've got time to kill sort of thing. Like, I've even got a Game Boy with me, but I've got it on my phone. I just, just play this, you know, whatever, real quick. Yeah. Um, I've sat on, like, like uh, airport tarmacs just hoping that we, that, that like, we have to wait longer <laughs> because... Yeah. Like, I'm about to have to move, and I'm in, like, the best game of Tetris in my entire life. Um, so keep delaying it as long as you want. Um, once this game's over, I'll be pissed with every- like everyone else is, but I've got, I've, I've got, to, I've got to get this done. Nice. Um, I went to a, a Christian school, and we had chapel every week. So my friends and I would just pass Tetris back and forth on my phone. And uh, every now and then you'd catch someone trying to start a second game. You, once you died, you had to pass it. Um, so like, you know, w- either like one or the other friend would just be like, hey, dude, I saw that. Pass it over right now. Come on, let's go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nice. But uh, I think my favorite version is still the Game Boy version because it's like the hardest one. Really? Um, I When you're playing some of the more recent like cell phone ones, you can see them being really fair to you giving you a long piece every like predict like at a predictable rate right uh and then even some of the newer ones allow you to save a piece and a slot um and then show you four pieces and then you can even sometimes spin them infinitely even when they're on the ground just be like i keep spinning it until okay here's the spot i want that's that's dumb so uh yeah tetris has rules now uh it's one of the reasons why you'll never see tetris battle guide in, in america uh, the rules are you have to be able to save a piece. All those things I just said have become like canonized, mm. which I think has done more to like to snuff it out. I don't know. It's not really snuff, but you don't talk about Tetris much anymore. Right. It's just a, a thing that's ubiquitous. We've all played it. Uh, it's not as big in the mainstream as it used to be. I and mean, I, Poyo Poyo I, Tetris was pretty big for the yeah. Switch. Um, and I I played the demo a lot. I bought the game, and then I really haven't played it much. Yeah, it, it kind of sucks. Um, <laughs> I, I I really like playing the Poyo Poyo Tetris like back and forth mode. Yeah. Um, same thing with uh, Tetris versus Doctor Mario on uh, Super Nintendo. Yeah, that has a really fun mode. My mom and I played that a lot because she is a masterful Doctor Mario player. I'm I've never been that good at Doctor Mario. Yeah. Um, I, I hated like Do- it. I like Doctor Mario. I, I hated it as a kid, but <laughs> my mom. My aunt, who taught me a lot about video games when I was little, and then their parents, my grandma and grandpa, could beat the crap out of me in Dr. Mario. Wow. So, as like a seven-year-old, I was just like pissed at that game. (laughs) Yeah. All these adults were just so much better than I was, but I've gotten better at it. But yeah, that kind of like Puyo Puyo or the Dr. Mario mashup is a lot of fun. I like it. Um, But I like the Game Boy one because it's just raw. Uh things aren't predictable uh you only see one piece at a time like you have to know where to you know big part of tetris is knowing where to stash stuff while you wait for the good stuff to come or the or the piece you want so you have to be really quick on your feet on on game boy tetris i never get more than like 120 lines 150 lines it just gets too ridiculous to you're really good at it dude i was watching you play it the last couple weeks i i have pretty impressed i have my principles uh and I haven't played in a long time, but when you start playing more and more, and this is more gameplay stuff, you'll you'll start to see patterns and where you want to put stuff, or you try to. You, there's a strategy to try and set yourself up for for a win. So, so that's your history with the game. Yes, pretty much. Sit back and chill, homie, while we pay the bills. And now it's time for real or fake. The point in the show where one host tries to stump the other by describing a Game Boy game that is real or fake. 
Guess whose turn it is? Your turn. It's my turn. I've Yay. done so well thus far. Maybe you can stump me. Maybe I can. Clay, this time uh, we're going to be looking at a game called Cool Spot 2, Spot Goes to Hollywood. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. Well, I definitely know there's a Spot game on the Are game Are you familiar board. with the Spot series? I am. He's a little red dot. He's a little corporate Sprite. mascot. Right? A 7-Up, I think. Dang it, you're right. Yeah. It is 7-Up. Close enough. The Uncola. Never had it. Never All right, well. so who developed this game? Is developed by, well, developed by Eurocom, published by Virgin Interactive. Okay. And then, that's always such a brash cutoff. <laughs> um, so is, did this release in all three territories? Uh, almost. Almost. What does that mean? Uh, one of the versions did, but not the Game Boy version. This is like a, a, so this a, is a multi. Port. Yeah, this is like a. So this port. also came out on the NES. Uh, no, no, it's later than that. It just be like Super Nintendo, like Genesis era. So when Spot goes to Hollywood, what is he doing there? Is he trying to become an actor? Or no, I think is this just... the story of him like getting the sponsorship with with Seven Up? I I know. Like, does he audition? See, at the I, end? I can't speak to that level of intimacy with the plot. Um, I can tell you that he's probably still jumping on stuff or killing things. Right. Uh, I assume that the Hollywood lets them like throw any number of funny stereotypes and dinosaur cameras. level. Yeah, like maybe cameras and lights and things dropping from the sky. I don't know. Makes me think of Animaniacs. Yeah. So does, is this the the one where Spot finally has his first dialogue? I think you. Uh, I can't answer that question, and I think you've already asked three. So, <laughs> dang it! I was just gonna keep asking questions yeah. until you cut me off. Yeah, I, so. I don't. I don't know anything about that last one, so it's a good. It's a good thing. I can picture one seven one Spot game. I want to say I had like a green cover, and it was him on the front. I'm not remembering anything with Hollywood, so. It's a pretty believable premise for a sequel, for sure. Um, but most of these uh, corporate uh, tie-in, you know, mascot games don't typically have long-lasting longevity to them, even in this time period. So I'm going to go ahead and say it is fake. So it's real. Dang it. But it never came to Game Boy. Oh, yeah. So okay. you have outlasted. Oh, that was a good one though. Sequels are hard because mm -hmm. you're like, I don't know, because some like back then games were all about sequels. So it is a it SNES is an, game. It is a uh, uh, Mega Drive, Saturn, and PlayStation. So it's even later. Oh whoa, yeah, yeah. Spot was still a thing then. I guess so. Um, I remember Weird. them starting to phase those ads out. By this point, this game released in oh wow. So this was like a late port. Uh, to Saturn and PlayStation. It released in 95. On um, Mega Drive. The, and Saturn and PS1 were both out in 95 in some capacity, so they right. just kind of ported it later. It came to EU and Japan in, like, 97. At that oh. point, they were I think they were doing, like, Make 7 of Yours and stuff, or if they hadn't, they, they were going to soon. So, as far as real spot, or cool spot games, whatever they're called, um, there's... There was one for the Game Boy, I believe. Yeah. The Cool Spot Adventure. But I'm looking at it here, and I've got like three different versions. But I think one of them is like the EU version. One's the Japanese, and one's probably the American I, I mean, one. I've just got Cool Spot. I mean, the game that was on every system that everybody... Okay, so there is two then. Because there's yeah. this one called Spot, the cool, co uh, sorry, Spot colon the Cool Adventure. Yeah. So that must be different. But uh, I'm... Maybe that maybe a little bit. I I would assume someone else no made it. That's quite a different tagline. It's not like they just changed it for like the Europeans or something. Yeah, I I maybe someone else developed it and Virgin had the license because Virgin uh games produced Cool Spot for right, everything. Right. Right. Um, but then the sequel was produced by Eurocom, which they just pawned it off to them, I guess. Yeah. I, I will admit I'm not up to date on my uh, cool spot uh it's all right. stuff but uh fun fact uh, Tommy Tellerico was the composer Who's that? Um okay. He it it just means I'm older than you. 
You I, are. I remember a time when Tommy Tellerico still had some clout. No, he well, the name doesn't. sounds familiar. That's he, why I'm like, he's a co- he's a composer. He's a like sound producer. He's worked on a bunch of games you would know. Um, he's also kind of a the short jerk. I don't know. <laughs> okay. He he's just I I don't know. I've never really cared for Tommy Tellerico. I think by the time that I was aware of him, he was already like full blown ego all over G four. Um, mm. just being loud and. Look how many different kinds of footsteps we put into this game I made. You could just have one kind of footstep, that kind of a guy. Right. So. All right. Know. Well, there you go. Cool spot goes to Hollywood. It's real. But and fake. Not on the Game Boy. So, points for me. Huzzah. All right. All right. Coming back in with Tetris Song Type B mm-hmm. rolls off the tongue. Oh, uh, yeah. what also, a title. also great song. Anyway, definitely. Uh, we're gonna start rolling through some of our like actually covering the game itself. Um, starting with story. Yay, Tetris story. So when a short block and a T-shaped block love each other, and a square-shaped block. And then a Z-shaped block, and a backwards Z-shaped block, and an L-shaped block, and a backwards L-shaped block. When they all love each other very much. Um, they all die? I guess. They, they become one un, uninterrupted row and disappear forever. So let that be a lesson to you, kids. <laughs> Don't ever fall in love. Yes. Don't especially. ever get into a seven-way relationship. Right. It's going to end with you all spontaneously combusting. Um, I mean, there's, there's not really a story to this game. Nope. Um... There are little like bits and pieces in like when you get a really high score that like certain things will happen in the NES version or like the guy who flew a plane from West Germany into Moscow's Red Square just like flew low. I think just just to mess with them. Uh, so that that gets immortalized. Rocket launches happen sometimes, but um, yeah, that guy flew a plane in, got arrested, so someone decided to put it in the game itself. I'm sorry, I zoned out for a minute, and I came back in and was completely lost as to where you're at. It's okay. The Cold War was weird, dude. Cool. (laughs) Um, As far as gameplay and levels go, um, in the Game Boy version, there aren't really actually any levels. Uh, You can play Type A or Type B. Type A is it goes forever and ever and ever. Type B is get 25 lines and get a high score. And so it's like, see how many points you can get before it 20, runs out, basically. Yeah, before you clear 25 lines. Right. Um, uh, the game does get faster as, you know, you hit 10 rows. It'll speed up each time. Um, in the NES version, there the different speeds were represented by colors. So uh, once you'd hit 50 lines, you would be, like, in this kind of gray and, like, dark orange, like, warmer color uh, palette. Uh, I always thought it reminded me of like Bebop and Rocksteady. Yeah. Specifically the Rhino. I always thought that was like, the, I could never remember which one's which anymore. Yeah, I couldn't tell you. But um, yeah, so there was like a differentiator there, but in the Game Boy version, it just gets faster and you, it doesn't really, there's really no visual cue for it. Yeah. Um, the gameplay is the pieces start at the top and end up at the bottom and you can spin them and drop them in any how do the controls work uh press a button to rotate it um the b and a do opposite directions i forget i they might i don't know you just use one i just use one um you have the you have the uh, manual right in front of you i do have the manual right so maybe you could look that up i could look that up Uh, the arrow keys are very straightforward can you pause the game yes you can but you can't see the screen or so so it, you like, can't pause it, it and like plan out right. you're doing. That's pretty smart of them to like blank it out so yeah. that you can't sit there and plan it. That's that's pretty cool. Yes. Um, uh, a and B will rotate in different directions. Okay, so you have like clockwise and counterclockwise. Yeah. Okay. Um Does Select do anything? I'm assuming probably not. Pro- uh no, unless I think maybe you have to help well, like I don't even know if it uses like the old classic way which select was to move through the menu. Um right. I don't even think it does that. Okay. Um, but so, yeah, your you, your goal is to just keep 
clearing away clutter. It's just that itchy brain kind of game. Totally. Um, there are different styles. There are people who just keep clearing lines as they go. Um, there's also me, who I leave a slot all the way at the far right side or left side if things get messed up. Um open so that I can drop a skinny piece down there at any right. point. Um, that is harder because you have to, you only have eight, seven rows to play with instead of an eighth row to, to move all your stuff around through. Um, but I think that the real thing about Tetris is placing things in such a way that you have more options. Uh, you won't be able to fit every, like let's say all seven pieces can't feasibly fit like Usually the square block will is there to throw you out of, uh, out of your rhythm. Right. But trying to keep a way that okay, if I get four out of the seven, you know, four out of these seven pieces can go in a decent spot and still leave me with options for the next piece. So you're trying to always leave yourself open for for options to to clear up and while you're waiting for that long skinny piece because that's the savior of us all. Indeed. Um, other than that, there's no real tricks. Eventually, there would be tricks, uh, like we talked about earlier, saving pieces. Um, some games probably had you bomb the other person you were playing against, you know, two-player games. So. so, But it's really, really, really simple on the Game Boy. Two-player, you said. Is that... How does that work? Is I assume it... you can either play type A and go till someone dies, or type B and race to 25. Uh, you use the link cable... Um, That's right. It's the first game I ever played on a link cable. I think it was the first game that you could use a link cable for. So I I got my Game Boy like a year and a half, two years later. So okay, so I was there like, would have been more at that point. But right. everyone had Tetris, so my Game Boy came with Tetris. So I was right there with someone else with a Game Boy and immediately just started playing two-player nice. Tetris. And got my just got destroyed, but you know, uh, whatever. Yeah, but it was still pretty cool. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, it's a good one to play two player. I would, I would assume. So, uh, as far as the visuals are concerned, uh, they do a decent job of using the four quote unquote colors to differentiate each piece from each other. The way they're shaded um, is really what it is. Like, there's the straight pieces are kind of a solid gray with little dotted, um, I don't know, pixels on them to give them more of a like grayer I don't know uh it's everything like is like I don't know shading is the best way I can I can put it so uh it, everything looks distinct um color games have it where they're different colors so it's easier to tell but th this still actually works pretty well um other than that like yeah there's there's not the Tetris can you can play Tetris on a uh um alphanumeric ASCII display. Right. That's what it was created on. It was created on a computer that was just like dashes dropping from the screen. Like there's there's really... You can spruce up Tetris as much as you want. It's still just the most simple Shapes. game ever. Simple, yeah. Yeah. Totally. And so that was an, a great... I'm sure it made it super easy to develop for the console and it just works well on the Game Boy because mm -hmm. you really only have just dark shapes and so you don't need to be seeing a whole lot of detail or anything so it's like perfect for the game boy especially early on yeah and, w and once you show this game to someone who is a programmer or like back then they can look at it and go oh i i know how this game works like you know the genius is just the game itself but anyone that was playing it and a programmer was like yeah we could port this easy like right. I, I already can see like, everything i need to do to set this game up so um yeah nice yeah, we're kind of at the part in the episode where we already hit all of the juicy stuff, and so we're just this last half is kind of like yeah. Here, here's Tetris. Like, how do you explain Tetris <laughs> to someone? Tetris is like almost it's it's all just mental. It's all like a head game the entire time. So like, I don't know really how to explain it to someone. I don't know how to explain strategy to 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 anyone. I I just I know how to play it. Right, um, but. The next section is probably the other interesting thing worth talking about, and uh, that is the music. Yeah, um, I think it was Mirasoft pretty early on, and one of their ports was like, "We need to sell this as like this is this mysterious thing that came from the Soviet Union." 
So why don't we put some Soviet pictures in the background and let's use all like Russian music. So the idea of, of having it themed as, hey, this is forbidden fruit, even all the way down to the music was, was there before. So I think Nintendo decided to keep that idea. Um, we've talked about Hip Tanaka on the show before. Yeah. He did the music for, for Tetris. Um, earlier you were saying that it reminded you of like a Pokemon song. Kind of, some of and them. I, yeah, I could totally, the could non, totally see that. The non-Russian style ones. Right, anything that he had to originally come up with himself. Right. So I could totally see that. Uh, do you want to go into a little bit more about the music? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so basically the player can select one of three types of background music during the game. Uh, or, or you can literally play without any music at all, with only uh, sound effects. That's not fun. Yeah, who would ever do that? Like, what happened to your soul, you know? <laughs> uh, two of the songs are arrangements of works from other composers. Type A is based on the Russian, uh, Russian folk song. Oh, jeez. Uh, do you want to... You Korobianiki. Sure. Korobianiki. Although I said it kind of Japanese, but whatever. Korobianiki. Also known as Korobushka. And Type C is arranged is an arranged version of French suite number three in B minor. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to read all that other stuff. Uh, by Johann Sebastian Bach. Johann. Johann. Go. I know. I, I said it. Uh, type C is, is definitely my favorite. Okay. Uh, out of the three. Uh, I do like type B a lot. Uh, but type A is the Tetris song. Like that is the song you think of when you think of the Tetris song. Um, I know that uh, Alexei Pajanov had no input on what music they put on there, but he he has say, he, said he has said stated or said uh, <laughs> since that he's kind of sad that they used Type A because that's like a traditional Russian folk song uh. that means a lot to a lot of Russian people, I presume. And that the whole world knows it as the Tetris song. Uh, and he's like, you know, that I would have liked the culture of, you know, it, to uh, to live on as like a, a Russian cultural thing instead of an international cultural thing. Right. So I think that pretty much covers everything, wouldn't you say, Brian? Oh yeah. Um, I I can't think of anything else I really want to say other than I just final thoughts. Tetris. Give me your final thoughts. Uh, I love Tetris. Okay. All right. Yeah. Cultural phenomenon. All I, that. I will continue to play it as long as I live. Basically. Cool. That's that's I can dig that. Yeah. I, I like the game. It's not my favorite. Uh, but I see why people enjoy it, and I appreciate it for what it is. I think my mother-in-law randomly is like really good at Tetris. So I don't know. It's uh, it's just something that's. You're right. It's maybe not as prevalent today, but it's still around, and it's still something that older people maybe even would play a lot more. Yeah. Um, uh, what was it? When Hank Rogers first showed Tetris to Nintendo and like Japan Nintendo, like NCL, uh, he gave it to Yamauchi, Mr. Yamauchi, who passed it off to Miyamoto, was like, hey, take a look at this game. And uh, like a few days later, like later on that week, he was like, what, what do you think about that game? And he's like, oh, it's it's really good. Like, it's really good. <laughs> and Mr. Yamauchi was like, well, well like what do you mean like how do you know it's really good and he's like because all of your accountants uh secretaries th they're all playing it right now like right now this this very second they're all obsessed with it so this is like a game that appeals to anybody yeah uh hank rogers also told Minoru arakawa of NOA, look pack tetris in with your game boy in america because if you pack in mario it will be a system for kids if you pack in tetris it will be a system for everyone. And it turned out that most of their marketing started being focused at adults who yep. were on the train or on the bus or whatever. Yep. Um, it became the system for everybody. Totally. It's just a, it's a very important game. Um, it's very addictive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, fun little side story. There's this band that I'm a huge fan of and they, every time they go on the road, uh, one of their, I think it's one of the guitarists. He works their merch booth, and he has two Game Boys with the link cable set up at the merch <laughs> booth. And he has an ongoing. It's been a thing for years. If you can beat him in Tetris, you get like free merch. Um, but 
I almost did it once just because they're Game Boys and I was tempted, but I was like, I suck at Tetris and I can guarantee you this guy's got to be really he's good. He's got to be really good. If he's just like been hustling people right. on the road all he's these been years. hustling hard and I'm just like, oh, he's probably really good. But I, be, I, w- I, I would, would love be, to watch you go against him. I, I would have to train back up again. I'm not in my prime anymore. Yeah. I, I have, like I said, I haven't had a flip phone uh, in like a decade. So that means I haven't been playing Tetris on the regular for like a decade, but yeah. in, in my heyday, I probably could have taken him down. It's probably a darn shame that there's like, not a very simplified basic version on smartphone. It's, I was going to say, I'm sure there's a Tetris you could get on your phone, oh yeah. but it's probably awful. It's and, touchpad. Yeah. I, don't, I don't really want to play with a touchpad. Well, I mean, you could make that work. You could it's just be right. The left and right. That would be kind of when terrible. you're in like when you're in it and like you're way deep in the game and the puzzle pieces are coming really fast. You you don't have time to wonder where your thumb is. Right. You, you need to be on like a, a click wheel or a little directional thing or something. You, you you need to know where left, right, and spin is. Right. And now up and down because you can you can push the pieces down or you can just say press up and they drop immediately to the ground. That's right. And then they have that little silhouette thing, which also bothers some people. And I don't think it's true Tetris, but it's really nice to have. Yeah. It's really cool. It makes it it makes everything <laughs> so much better. It's definitely not true, but I agree. It, right, it, it is nice. So yeah, I I just it, smartphones. It just it doesn't work. Yeah, you play Bust a Move on a smartphone though. That'll oh, work. That's a fun game. Yeah, I like Bust a Move. That's probably one of my favorite puzzle games. It's pretty great. Yeah, that, that one definitely got me into puzzle games a little more. I'm like, all right, I can di- I can dig this one. Yeah, hang out with Bub and Bob and shoot colored balls at a roof. Those are my boys. Yeah. Um, I was actually looking at what our next Super Game Boy episode is, and we have written down uh, Doctor Mario. Ooh, so, oh wow, we we did them back to back, huh? I, I guess I don't know. We might have to see if we can fit something else. There in should there. there's got to be something else that we're not thinking of in between. I you yeah. know I'd say like Nintendo Tennis even. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll find. That's got to be like an early title. So yeah, we'll, we'll try look. to find something else. That way, it's not puzzle to puzzle game yeah all right so uh two thumbs up brian oh yeah cool i'm not gonna give a rating because you'll just get mad at me no no it's cool we already have two thumbs up so okay yeah i'm I'm cool and now it's time for this week's song of the week So we were driving uh, in the car, I think it was last week, and Game Scoop put a lot of Konami music into their one episode. Yep. And uh, I went home and just mainlined all the Konami music I could find. Uh, Bayou Billy's really good. I forgot how good that soundtrack is. But uh, so we were looking into songs for our episode this week, and I figured that uh, we didn't really have anything to go on. So I figured the best thing for me to do was to go find a list of Konami games and find a game that I don't know. And this one's called Quarth. Quarth. Uh, Quarth. Not the Ferengi from uh, from Star Trek, but uh, Quarth. Mm. Um, it's kind of funny that we picked this game. We we went for the music alone. It's got that really weird bass note that kind of throws everything off, but that's good. Like, it's very uh, different. Unexpected things in music, as long as they sound good, are always a treat. Totally. So uh, we were like, yeah, okay. Well, why don't we take a look at what this game is? And it's like a cross between a puzzle game and a shoot 'em up. Yeah, it's actually really cool. And it it looks a lot like Upside Down Tetris. It kind of looks like Tumblestone in a way. Yeah. Uh, but second Tumblestone mentioned. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, too. So much puzzle references on this one, but, but yeah, it, it, honestly, we didn't plan it this perfectly. Uh, it just—I also kind of want to go find Quark now, dude. So. It's actually really fun. I just played it for like a minute and a half, but I'm liking it. And it was still really slow, and it hadn't got intense, but I'm sure it gets like super intense as it gets faster. Oh yeah, yeah. and and everything gets closer to you because it, it looked like the the pieces slowly get closer. Yeah. But uh, you you got uh, 
blocks lines and you want to fill them in to make a perfect rectangle or square. Right. You basically a quadrilateral. And uh, once that fills up, it disappears. So it's kind of a bust a move slash Tetris kind of shooter game. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, and actually, perfect choice for for this episode. So yeah, it's got some cool music. Uh, it was a nice, nice little suggestion. It was a good find. Um, yeah, I mean, I would love to review it on the show, but I mean, we're literally Let's give it some time. Clearly, we're uh, <laughs> we're chock full of puzzle games right now. But if you're looking for a, a different puzzle game you maybe never played before, definitely go check out Korth. Yeah, I, it's on NES too. NES Game Boy. Is so. it? It's on NES. Yeah, I was looking at some NES footage. So I would yeah. like to get that on NES. Yeah. That would probably be even cooler. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this episode of uh, this super strictly episode of Super Game Boy. So super. Super strictly Game Boy. Uh, If you want, you can find out more, uh, find more of our episodes or find out more about our episodes. Either way. On the NintendoVillage.com. And we are also on the Nintendo Village YouTube uh, as well as iTunes. So, uh, yeah. You guys are great. We love you all. Join us next episode uh, for Ghostbusters 2. Yeah, That's Ghostbusters we'll, we'll 2. We'll be playing that. That's, so if you, a fun one. if you want to, you could actually start now, pull up the game and play it along with us. Yeah. And then join us for the following episode where we talk about it. Yeah, and you can either be angry at the game or happy with the game, depending on how the game is. And, right. You know. We'll either be angry or happy and probably share your opinion. So. Which, spoiler, this game has a little bit of both. I yeah, would say. Uh, yeah, I, I would too. So, so uh, But yeah, it's kind of like a little book club we could do where we let people know what we're doing. And it's they so can, cute. Yeah, a little Ghostbusters 2 book club. Uh, what, if they want to send us uh, song suggestions or uh, histories with the game, yeah. uh, you can... Before the episode comes out, uh, was it clay at the Nintendo Village.com is your email? Yeah, yeah, that's it. And then we also have what at Strictly Game Boy is that the Twitter handle? Uh, it's yeah, no, actually, it's at uh, Nint- Village Nintendo. At Village Nintendo. Yeah, it's really weird. We had to put it the other way around, but. <laughs> All right, so yeah, if you've got stories about Game Boy or uh, Ghostbusters Two, that you know, if we if we get a few stories in, we might bring them up on the show. And, uh, yeah, please send a song request. And thank you for listening to Strictly Game Boy. I, I looked up how to say goodbye in Russian, so I'm going to give it a stab. This is going to be awful. Probably. Proshe. Yes, it was. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe, check out some of our other videos, and visit the NintendoVillage.com, your home for everything Nintendo.